Hi, my name is uh, Kevin Merritt. I'm a paramedic with the Scamby County EMS here in Pensacola, Florida. First thing when I get here, I like to check out my truck. I've got to get my drugs assigned to me and my computer. Um, we got to make sure and do a walkthrough with the truck, make sure all of our stuff is in date, all of our equipment's working properly. Um, that way, whenever we do get out there on calls, uh, we don't have any issues that's going to delay uh, patient care. Um, that's pretty much a typical morning and then of course once we have everything checked off and we're ready to go we get in service and from there we're posted out throughout the entire area um, to uh, run calls. Um, just a couple of the typical calls that we run here uh, with EMS. Uh, we do a lot of chest pain calls. Uh, basically we get a call that goes out uh, through the radio dispatch dispatches to uh, our um, address when we get on scene. Uh, basically patients complaining of chest pain there are certain questions as paramedics that we want to have answered at that point in time uh, such as when did it start what does it feel like where does it go uh, reproducible pain versus non reproducible pain uh, any events that led up to the pain as it started and we want to take and ask these those questions so we can start going through our differential diagnosis on what's really going on with the patient and uh, here to Scambia we're really pushing for um, uh, 12 leads are placing the patient on a cardiac monitor so we can see what's going on with their heart. Um, so, so one of our jobs here is to take our life pack 12s and go ahead and place the patient on our cardiac monitor, identify any type of dysrhythmia or um, changes in their EKG, and if there is, uh, then we need to go ahead and act appropriately. Uh, once we do have that going, um, the 12 lead, we're able to transmit that 12 lead straight to the ER, to the doctor, um, and identify any type of um, ongoing care that's going to be needed once they get to the ER. And that's a major responsibility for us field paramedics, is to get that 12 lead into that doctor's hands in the ER so we can activate any type of system that needs to help this patient out. A um, couple of the other calls that we do do, um, we run trauma calls. Uh, people that are injured from either ground level falls, uh, vehicle accidents, uh, or any type of uh, violent act that might be uh, committed out there. Um, we have those, and we have your typical sick calls or your medical calls. Uh, patients that have had uh, nausea, vomiting, fevers, uh, persisting for a couple of days, or they've got some type of disease process that's caused them to be a little bit um, uh, sick and it's progressively gotten worse over time. Um, after every call, we have to do uh, charts on all patient contact. Uh, we've got to get patient information. We've got to get histories on these patients, uh, medicines, allergies. Uh, basically delve into uh, the, what's going on with our patient and get a little bit of background as to what's leading up to our current patient's uh, issue at that time. Uh, all that's in our state report that we do, all on a computer. And at the end of the day, once we're done with that chart, we do upload it to the main system here so we could uh, keep records uh, of all patients that we have. Um, and then we start our off-going process, and that's usually going to be rechecking the truck, checking all of our equipment again, make sure everything's back into working order, because as soon as I leave our, uh, the truck in the morning, another crew's probably going to be coming on. We want them to be ready uh, for that in the morning. To become a paramedic, um, one first has to go through EMT school, um, and once you've completed EMT school, which is probably around f uh, four months uh, for most programs, um, then uh, you go ahead and apply for paramedic school. Sometimes it's recommended to go ahead and get a little bit of field experience first before going into paramedic school. That way you're better prepared uh, for what's ahead of you. Uh, but once you do get into paramedic school, uh, most programs uh, are going somewhere around 14 to about 16 months of uh, education. And what that entails um, is a lot of class time, both in respiratory emergencies, um, medical emergencies, um, cardiac. Um, you'll go through specific trainings for advanced area maneuvers. Uh, how to handle certain calls, uh, pharmacology, learning drugs, dosages, medications, um, when they are appropriate to use. Um, you'll also go through internship uh, at the end of that. Uh, during the course of your paramedic schooling, uh, you'll also have clinicals that you'll have to do. Those clinicals will be performed in an ER on an, uh, and with an EMS service. Um, and of course, once you're done with uh, your classes 
and you're ready to go into internship, you have a specific amount of hours, and it varies from state to state uh, on what you have to do to, um, to gain that uh, internship hours and requirements. And when you start your internship, you're pretty much on that truck with a training officer or pre uh, some type of preceptor, and um, you're performing as a uh, paramedic, and uh, they'll evaluate you and uh, basically say okay this person's ready to move on and go ahead and go through the state level and uh, you'll finish your internship you'll sit for your uh, programs uh, uh, test for the program and if you've passed you can go ahead and submit it to um, the uh, licensing organization <clears throat> and uh, sit for your test and you have a written test and you have a practical test you have to take and pass both of them in order to become licensed as a paramedic um, and uh, from then on, once you've got your license, uh, you do have to maintain your educational level. Therefore, every two years you have to apply for your uh, state license and uh, you have a certain amount of uh, continuing uh, education credits that have to be obtained. And like most EMS organizations, uh, you do have certain um, uh, qualifications in order to meet their minimum standards, stuff su uh, such as uh, ACLS, which is Advanced Cardiac Life Support uh, cards, uh, PALS cards, which is Pediatric Advanced Life Support, ITLS, International Trauma Life Support, um, or any type of license that you have to hold in order to be a paramedic. Um, being a paramedic can be very rewarding. Um, I'm just going to share with you a, a, an instance here recently. Um, I responded to a call of a cardiac arrest of a, of a young gentleman about 50 -ish, uh, years old. Um, and when we got on scene, uh, he was in complete arrest. Um, we had to uh, shock him uh, with our monitor several times. We had to intubate him, which is placing the tube into his airway and breathe for him. We had to give him uh, meds through IVs that we started throughout there with him. And, uh, you know, we were on scene for uh, quite a while and we were able to get his uh, heart started back and um, got him out to the uh, hospital. And uh, when we followed up to see how the patient did, uh, we were surprised to hear that uh, he's doing rather well. Uh, as a matter of fact, he spent about six days in the hospital and was discharged with no deficits. And he was uh, uh, down or, or pretty much uh, dead for about uh, five, seven minutes or so. And uh, I had the pleasure of actually speaking with this gentleman on the phone uh, a few days ago. And, uh, he sounded very upbeat, says he feels fine, feels better than before, and as a matter of fact is uh, going to be making a trip back into town to uh, say hey to us and uh, thank us personally for saving his life. And those are some of the rewarding things about being a paramedic because we know that we've made a difference in this guy's life. I spoke to his mother. His mother cried over the phone and says, you saved my baby. And I, she couldn't tell you how appreciative she was for us and it made me feel really good. Um, and like with all jobs, you've got the good with the bad, and um, being a paramedic is rough. I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. It's a high-stress uh, high job. Um, you've got to be prepared for the good and the bad. There are some good calls, and then you come into the really bad calls. We have to handle uh, death, mayhem, and destruction on, on pretty much on a day-to-day -day basis, and if you cannot handle it, then it's probably not the, the right job field for you. Uh, you have to be able to handle pediatric calls, and um, I myself, being a father, uh, have to deal with pediatric calls, and those hit really home for me, and they're really hard, especially when you have a little one that's in front of you that's uh, passed away or severely injured. We have to emotionally step away or step outside of ourselves and do what's right by the patient because they're more important to us at that point in time. And you'll hear it from every paramedic out there. There are calls out there that, that really bother us. Um, and uh, sometimes it, it, it's so bad that we have to take a couple days off for it or, or talk to a counselor. And uh, it's, it's really rough. You know, we try to be, uh, you know, motions and, and just separate from ourselves and be the man of steel or women of steel here and uh, separate ourselves. Um, but uh, you have to be able to handle all types of calls and some of these bad calls can uh, mess with you on a mental level. 
Um, another frustrating part about uh, the job as well uh, is some days, you know, you may not run that many calls, and then there are other days where you're just getting call after call after call after call. You're falling behind on paperwork. You haven't eaten lunch, and we work 12-hour shifts, and sometimes, actually most of the time, we're not getting off after our 12-hour shifts. We carry over. I've been on shift for as much as 16 to 19 hours running calls because that's how many calls we're having within a day. If you're just starting off and looking for some type of direction, uh, I strongly suggest uh, those of you to take a CPR course. Um, that'll give you an idea of what we do out there every day, scenarios that we do. Uh, and it's a great skill to learn. Um, for those of you that are still in high school, um, I would recommend that you go ahead and uh, focus in on your math studies and uh, take some sciences, uh, biology, if you, if you will. Um, that's really going to help prepare you for uh, the courses that you're going to need to take once you get into college. And those that have graduated high school and that are now in or going into college, uh, some of the courses that I can recommend for you to take that's going to help you, obviously, is your anatomy and physiology courses. That's uh, going to give you an, uh, a high understanding about the human body and uh, everything that you're going to need to know about it. Um, uh, I would also recommend some psychology courses or sociology courses because out there we do deal with a lot of individuals that uh, have some type of uh, behavioral issues or social problems and this will help you um, uh, understand and how to approach some of those patients. Um, and as always, you know, make sure you take some math courses because there is a lot of drug math out there that we do use in the field when we have to calculate weight-based drugs um, uh, or deal with uh, the administration of um, certain medications and having to do all types of formulas whenever we calculate drips. So um, those are things that I highly recommend for those that are thinking about pursuing a career in EMS as a paramedic. Um, and uh, for those that really want to learn uh, and, and get the full effect of being a paramedic, I would strongly recommend third rider programs. Most organizations do have them. Once you are above 18 years of age, uh, you can check with your EMS um, provider wherever you're at and see if they offer a third rider program. That's where you can come in and ride along in the ambulance to see what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And you're there for the entire shift from start to finish, and you're going to get an idea of what it's like to be a paramedic uh, with EMS.